My guest today is Ralph Ellis. Great to be back with you again, Tom. Yes, after our last video, which went down very well. Yes, uh, my name's Ralph Ellis. Um, I'm a polymath, you might say. I was trained as a mineral surveyor, and then I became a computer analyst, a truck driver, an airline captain, and a climate scientist. So apart from that, I haven't really done very much during my lifetime. And uh, yes, so this, this climate business has uh, become much larger in my studies at present. And this is the result of uh, a, uh, a presentation I did at Glastonbury in England, uh, which went down quite well. So hopefully viewers will enjoy it. So my name's Ralph Ellis. Yes, this is my uh, talk, Climate and Energy Misinformation. Uh, but I think this is actually more disinformation than it is misinformation, because I think this subject is being deliberately badly taught. Um, so what does Ralph Ellis know about uh, climate and energy? Well, as we just said just a minute ago, uh, I wrote this peer review climate paper called Modulation of Ice Ages by Dust and Albedo. Uh, very successful, 45,000 downloads and quite controversial because it says that during the ice ages, uh, temperature was not controlled by CO2. It was controlled by surface albedo. Uh, we're not going to go through this paper. Uh, I did do, as we've said before, a, uh, a talk on this paper on this uh, channel, which has done very well, 26,000 views or something. Um, but I will just show you one page from it, one diagram, which is this diagram, temperature versus CO2 during the ice ages. So here we have 800,000 years of data with all of the major ice ages on it. Temperature in red, CO2 in blue. Um, and you can see they're in lockstep together. And some climate scientists have erroneously assumed from this that CO2 is controlling temperature. But of course, correlation does not imply causation. Alternatively, we could look at the same graph and say that every time CO2 is high, the world cools. And every time CO2 is low, the world warms. So we could say that uh, high CO2 causes cooling and low CO2 causes warming. Now, it's more complex than that, of course, but you can see from this that there are other factors involved in temperature control on the planet. Um, because this would not happen if CO2 was a very strong greenhouse gas. Um, so how did this climate alarmism start? Well, it started with this graph here and hiding the decline. This is the famous hockey stick graph uh, from, oh gosh, it's nearly 25 years ago now, long time ago. So this is a reconstruction of uh, temperatures using tree rings and tree rings are not a very good proxy for temperature. If you imagine you have a very hot, very dry summer, trees will not grow very well, and therefore you'll end up with small tree rings. Anyway, they've reconstructed temperature from these tree rings, and you can see on here that they've managed to get rid of the medieval warming period and the uh, little ice age. Um, so their temperature just gently decreases uh, for, 950 years or so uh, until we get to the mid 20th century and suddenly temperatures rocket up and we're all gonna fry and we're all gonna die. Um, well, how did, was this graph created? Uh, the emails will give us a clue. This is one of the climate gate emails uh, back from 1999. It's from Phil Jones to uh, Ray Bradley and Michael Mann and Keith Briffer. These are all climate scientists. Um, and it says, um, I've just completed Mike's nature trick. Uh, Mike is Professor Michael Mann, uh, and nature is the journal, the scientific journal Nature. I have just completed Mike's nature trick of adding in the real temperatures to each, of the, uh, to each series for the last 20 years, i.e. from 1981 onwards, and from 1961 for Keith Briffer's data, in order to hide the decline. So what was this trick they were using and what was the decline that they were hiding? Um, well, we can get an idea of that from Keith Briffer's data. This is his data. Again, this is tree ring data uh, that has managed to get rid of the Little Ice Age. 
Um, 600 years of data here. And you can see the temperature bubbles up and down, not really doing very much at all, really, over uh, 550 years until we get to the mid-20th century and the temperature declines. It actually goes down in the uh, mid-20th century. Um, and this is known as the divergence problem. And the divergence problem says that tree rings record temperature precisely for hundreds of years until 1950, and then they stop. And if you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. Um, so what do you do if you find a decline, if you find a divergence problem in your tree ring data? Well, the answer is simple. You just cut off the end of the graph, you stitch in the thermometer data, and you've got yourself a hockey stick. And that's how the hockey stick graph was created. And that's why you see it nowadays in two colors like that, because it's a stitch of two different databases. Um, I call that disinformation myself. If tree rings cannot record temperatures properly in the 20th century, how can we trust them uh, for the centuries past? Um, but this disinformation continues and it's going on to the present day. So um, this is uh, BBC weather maps. You've probably all seen this, but it's a little bit of fun, so we might as well look at it. Uh, two BBC weather maps. Which one shows the hotter weather? Well, the one on the left, of course. Um, why have they done this? Well, the BBC said it was to aid people with visual impairment. Who here thinks that the uh, uh, map on the right is easier to see? No, this is part of the agenda, basically, trying to prove that we have uh, continual global warming. This is why the BBC is known as the most uh, disingenuous news organization known to man. And this has continued, of course, in all of the data that they're giving us. Uh, USA tornado numbers, what's happening to those where well, we all know that uh, tornadoes are getting stronger, they're getting worse, they're getting more frequent. Well, let's look at the data. And this data comes from the NOAA Storm Prediction Center, which is the go-to site for data of this nature. And we've got 70 years of data here. That's not a bad record, 70 years. And you can see that strong tornadoes, F3 to F5, have been decreasing for 70 years. And if you did not know that, why did you not know that? Why is this not um, front page news in all of the newspapers? And where is the climate emergency in this data? Same goes for hurricanes, tropical cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons. Um, we all know what's happening with those. They're getting worse. They're getting more frequent. Coastal communities are getting wiped out all across the uh, world. Uh, let's look at the data. This comes from Dr. Ryan Mao uh, using satellite data. Uh, this is 40 years of data. And we can see on the top part of this graph, um, all hurricanes and typhoons have been oh, decreasing very slightly for 40 years. And the uh, strong hurricanes and typhoons, no change over 40 years. Again, not exactly what the media is giving us in their information. And we can take this into centuries past because there was a paper that was written just last year. Uh, here is that paper by Chand et al, 2022. Uh, this is looking at proxy data of past tropical cyclones. And they showed that from 1850, uh, cyclones increased until 1900, and they've been decreasing for the last 120 years. Decreasing. Again, where is the climate emergency in this data? Um, it's simply not there. Let's look at Northern Hemisphere snow extent. Um, you're probably familiar with the uh, quote from Dr. David Viner of the CRU, uh, who said, our children will not know what, our children will not know what snow is. Um, uh, because of global warming. Well, let's look at the data. This data comes from uh, Rutka's uh, Snow Lab, the go-to site for data on uh, snow. Um, and this is 50 years of data. That's not too bad. And you can see that Northern Hemisphere snow extent has been, well, pretty much unchanged, really, over 50 years. So that hasn't changed either. And we can look also at polar temperatures and ice sheets because we all know we've got problems at the poles. 
Uh, they're all melting and we're all going to drown. Um, well, let's look at the uh, data. Uh, here is temperature. Uh, and the, this is from the UAH, which is University of Alabama Huntsville. They control a lot of the satellite data out of NASA. The top graph here is Arctic temperature, and they have increased uh, by one degree over the last 40 years. And you might say that's a problem. But if we look down to the south in the Antarctic, no change over 40 years. And that's odd. We've got this disparity between north and south. And we'll see this again in a minute with the um, sea ice. So let's look at sea ice. This is the uh, graph. And this data is from the uh, NSIDC, which is the National Snow and Ice Data Center in America. Again, the go-to site for uh, all information on uh, uh, the polar regions. So the uh, blue plot is Arctic. And we can see that Arctic sea ice has been decreasing for 40 years and is now increasing a bit. You might say that's a problem. There's been a 20% decrease in Arctic sea ice. Um, but if we look down in the south again uh, into the Antarctic, uh, there the sea ice has been increasing for 35 years and is now decreasing, um, mainly due to two very large storms they had there down in the South Atlantic. But what you can see here is that there is no correlation with uh, CO2 in this data. We have one hemisphere is uh, decreasing and the other hemisphere is increasing. Um, if CO2 was the current controlling agent, you might expect that you know, uh, CO2 is a global gas, we will get global effects. So there is a difference between North and the South. What is that difference? We don't know. Here's a suggestion. There is a difference in that this is the Arctic. Uh, this is forest soot and in Chinese industrial dust on, uh, on Arctic ice. This is up in the north. Uh, and this was um, images taken from the Dark Snow Project in 2012, over 10 years ago now. Um, but they only got one year of funding. Uh, they had their funding cut because they were not looking uh, for the effects of CO2. But anyway, you can see the Arctic is not quite as pristine as you might expect uh, at that time, and probably still now, there are many portions covered in uh, forest soot and industrial dust. So I'll leave that with you. You can have a think about that. Let's move on. <clears throat> polar bears, we can't go without mentioning polar bears. They are the uh, canary in the coal mine uh, for the climate industry. Here's a quote from the BBC. Polar bears will be wiped out. Why the alarmist language here? Why not reduced a little bit or something? But no, they're going to be wiped out by the end of the century unless more is done to tackle climate change, a study predicts. Now, this is pure disinformation from the BBC again, because they must have known about this graph from uh, Dr. Susan Crockford. Um, <clears throat> and this is over 60 years, 60 years of data. And you can see that polar bear numbers have been increasing for 60 years not only increasing, they have quadrupled over 60 years. Where is the wiped out in this data? Where is the climate alarmism in this data? This is why the BBC uh, is the most um, disingenuous uh, media organization known to man. <clears throat> um, so in conclusion to this first little part of this talk, uh, if there is no climate emergency, and we've seen the data that maybe there is not a climate emergency, there is no need for these net zero policies, um, which we're going to look at in a minute. But if you mention this in polite society, uh, the immediate answer will be 97% of climate scientists agree with anthropogenic global warming. So where did this come from? Well, it came from this paper by John Cook et al, 2013. There have been follow-up papers uh, more recently, which have the same problems within them. So what did this paper say? Well, they took 12,000 climate papers and 66% of them expressed no opinion. And so they threw those out of the window. Um, of the remainder, 3% uh, of papers rejected global warming. Ergo, you might say, 97% of papers with an opinion supported global warming. That's where the 97% comes from. But if you look deeper into this paper at the data, 
um, actually, it was only 24% of papers supported global warming. And myself, as a CO2 skeptic, would have to be a 24 percenter because there has been some warming. We don't quite know what is causing it, and we don't know precisely its magnitude, but there has been some warming. So de facto, I would have to be a 24 percenter. That's how broad the, um, the questions were with this. Um, and only 8 percent implicitly endorsed anthropogenic global warming, that it was all mankind's fault, and only half a percent of papers explicitly supported the IPCC version of anthropogenic global warming. So it was not 97%, it was only half a percent. Um, and the trouble being that all climate scientists are paid to agree with anthropogenic global warming. And he who pays the piper uh, chooses the tune. Um, so, and, and if you don't go along with that um, uh, agenda, that tune, uh, your funding can be cut and you can end up like these scientists who are uh, actually dismissed from their jobs. And that's the problem with modern academia is there is no freedom of speech, there is no freedom of res research, uh, and there is no freedom of publication. I had the same problem with my science paper that it was rejected because it was not explicitly supporting uh, CO2 global warming. And I had to go to another journal to get it actually peer reviewed and passed. Um, so this is a major problem with anthropogenic, with um, uh, modern academia. Uh, moving on, what are the, the true effects of CO2 then, since we're talking about CO2? Uh, well, we can see the effects of CO2 from these plants here. What's the difference between these plants? Well, CO2, of course. Those on the left have lots of CO2. Those on the right have very little. So the unspoken truth is that CO2 is plant food, and therefore CO2 is the most essential, essential gas in the atmosphere. Without CO2, all life on Earth will die. Um, so where are we at present? We are sitting at 400 parts per million and the plants are doing not so bad. But if the plants had more CO2, they would do even better, which is why greenhouse uh, growers pump up the CO2 in their greenhouses to 1500 parts per million to make the plants grow more strongly. Um, conversely, back in the last ice age, which is only 18, 17, 18,000 years ago, uh, CO2 was down at 190 parts per million. And as you can see, the plants are not doing very well. Worse than that, up on the Gobi, the, the highlands of Asia, the uh, Gobi Plateau, the equivalent CO2 came down to 150 parts per million. And this, the plants died, as you can see in this image. Uh, therefore, low CO2 equals plant death, um, which equals CO2 deserts. Now, you're all familiar with the normal desert, a precipitation desert. If there's no rain, the plants die, you get a desert. Uh, same happens with CO2. If there's no, not enough CO2, the plants die and you get a CO2 desert. And that actually happened during the last ice age. All life on Earth was being threatened during the last ice age, not by the growth of ice, not by the lowering of sea levels, uh, not by the cold, but by the lack of CO2. Conversely, during the Jurassic era, uh, CO2 was up at 2,500 parts per million, uh, which is six times more than uh, we have now. And the biosphere was fine. In fact, you could say the large size of dinosaurs was in part due to uh, extra CO2. More CO2 equals bigger plants, which equals bigger herbivores, which equals bigger carnivores. So don't let any uneducated teenagers tell us that uh, CO2 is bad for the biosphere. Clearly, it is the very foundation of the uh, biosphere. Um, so moving on to energy then, because that's what this has brought up this topic, is this new push all across the West for net zero and for 15 minute cities and so on. Strange that it's happening all across the West at the same time. It's almost as if someone is controlling this um, government policy, isn't it? So let's look at energy policy, except I don't think we have an energy policy. I think we have an energy fantasy instead. Um, now, 
the data I'm going to give is pertinent to Great Britain, because obviously that's where I live. But from what I've seen, America has exactly the same problems. So you can take this data and you can probably um, pass it across to America because you have exactly the same policies over there in, in America. So uh, let's look at our energy fantasy. Uh, UK electrical generation by type. This is a nice pie, pie chart of how we generate electricity uh, in Britain, and it's very similar in America as far as I'm aware, mainly from gas uh, in Britain. Oh, sorry, by gas, I mean the sort of um, atmospheric type gas, not the, the sort you pump into a, into a car. Um, so yeah, methane basically. Um, and on the left, uh, we have wind and solar in the purple and uh, the blue over there is bio. So at present, we've got renewables at 39% in Britain. And you might say, hooray, um, except not quite so hooray because that blue bit on the left there, that is Drax the Destroyer. Um, now, Drax used to be our largest power station in the UK, four gigawatts, was a coal burning station that sat on top of the coal fields that fed it. Um, it's not allowed to do that anymore, so they've turned it into a wood burning stove. Um, so now it burns American trees and Canadian trees. And last year it burned 18 million tons of trees. So it takes the trees in America, it pelletizes them, it transports them to the East Coast, it puts them on ships, it ships them across the Atlantic to the East Coast of Britain, it puts them on trains, and the trains drive the pellets up to the power station. Uh, as I say, burning 18 million tons of trees a year, and that figure is going to go up to 26 million tons of trees a year in the next few years. Um, is that a good idea? We're told to plant trees to save the environment. Well, Drax the Destroyer is burning them all. So there we go. I'll leave that with you again. The other problem is that UK fossil fuels are only 1 40th of what they are burning in China. So let's look at the Chinese pie chart. So this is again generation by fuel type. And you can see it's mostly black because it's mostly coal. Um, and so if you look on the sort of bottom left, the UK has 16 gigawatts of fossil fuels for electrical generation. Uh, China has 615 gigawatts. So if we want to show the uh, British pie chart in comparison, that's what it looks like. Yeah, so whatever we're doing in Britain is only a drop in the ocean in comparison with China. We can destroy our entire economy in Britain, and it'll have no effect whatsoever on CO2 if you think CO2 is a problem, which I don't, but there we go. Um, so what's China doing? Uh, is it trying to reduce all of its dependence on fossil fuels? Well, no, because last year China built 50 gigawatts of coal it commissioned in 2022 alone. That's three times more fossil fuels than Britain is using. And China commissioned that just last year. Yeah, OK, so that's a problem. But there are more problems. The next problem is that electricity is not energy. It's not total energy consumption. Um, so this is the same pie chart we saw before of electric generation in the UK. And I want you to have a look at the red sector at the top and the yellow sector on the right. That is oil and gas, methane gas. Um, so let's now go to total energy consumption and watch those grow. Yeah, OK, now that's total energy. What's the difference? Well, of course, total energy in includes transport, space heating, and industry. And so most of that is run by oil and methane gas. Um, and so renewables come down to only 16% of total energy used. Uh, and that's a problem because power generation in the UK needs to increase by 400% to cope with all energy demands, not just electricity. Um, and where are these new power stations being built? Well, as you know, these, these projects are 15 year, 20 year projects. And so you've got to be planning them now. 
uh, in order to have them ready by the deadlines, which are you know 2035 and 2050. Um, there is no planning for these extra power stations. Um, the other problem, is backup storage. And I know that America has the same problem because you don't have any backup in America either. Um, so backup storage, what's the problem here? Well, uh, renewables, wind and solar are intermittent. They often switch off. And so the ones we're looking for, this is um, UK energy production. This is for uh, December, 2021, but you'll find the same throughout the year, especially in the winter. What we're looking for here is blue, which is wind, and yellow, which is solar. Note there is no solar for the whole of December 2021 because solar doesn't work at 52 degrees north or 54 degrees north in the UK without overcast skies. Um, so don't let any uneducated teenagers try and tell you that solar works in northern Europe. No, it doesn't. There is no energy production here for the whole of December. And there was none for the whole of January either. Um, the other problem is you'll see a big lump missing here. So we had a six day wind outage with no solar in December 2021. And you've got to make up that, um, uh, that missing portion of the energy. And now what we're doing at present is using the purple here. And that's gas, methane gas. Um, but the government wants to get rid of all methane gas uh, powered energy by 2035. And if you get rid of that, you need an alternative backup storage system for energy. How much do we need? Well, I think we need 10 days of stored backup as an absolute minimum. I've seen some people calling for a whole month of backup, but I think 10 days would just about do it. Um, so how much energy would that be? Well, to back up half of our grid, uh, remember, we'll still have some nuclear, we'll have some bio, there might be a little bit of wind still going. So to back up half of the UK grid for 10 days is 4,800 gigawatt hours of energy. Now, don't worry about the units, just look at the magnitude, because this is not all the problem, because as we've just seen, electricity is only 25% of total energy consumption, because you have to allow for transport, space heating and industry. Um, so the total is multiply by four, which is 19,000 gigawatt hours of stored energy. That's what we require to back up 10 days of half of our grid. The problem being that UK only has 10 gigawatts of stored backup. <clears throat> so we need 19,000. We've only got 10. And I know America is in the same situation. You have very little backup. Uh, energy supplies. Now, what sort of energy backup are we going to use? Well, it's probably going to be something like this, which is Denorig Pumped Water Storage Facility. Um, well worth visiting. If you happen to be up in North Wales, uh, in Snowdonia, it's called Electric Mountain. You can have a tour of it. It's fantastic. Um, because it was in a national park, the Greens made that this um, uh, this this uh, power station was built inside a mountain. So they hollowed out a mountain and built the uh, power station inside that. Uh, that's why it was so darn expensive. And even if we could increase the um, capacity of Dinorwig threefold, we would still need 600 Dinorwigs to back up our energy. Where on earth are we going to build 600 Dinorwigs? We don't have... Um, the land space available, we don't have the mountains available. It's just not going to happen. Um, the government science advisor, Professor McKay, who we're going to look at in a minute, he suggested that we might flood the Welsh valleys and the Scottish glens. But I think the Welsh and the Scots might have something to say about that if we started to try and do that. So pump water storage is, is a problem because we just don't have the land available to actually make them, even if we had the money to build them. So how much would it cost? Well, Denorig in today's money cost 1.7 billion in pounds, good old uh, British sterling pounds. Uh, so the total cost will be about a thousand billion, a nice round trillion. And we can confirm this cost because they're building a new one up in Scotland that's called um, Corrie Glass. 
and that's going to cost 1.6 billion. This is the upper pond. So this is a pumped water storage system. You pump the water up uh, when you've got lots of extra electricity and you let it run back down again and generate some when you need it. Um, so it's a, uh, it's basically, it's a big battery basically um, using water as the uh, storage medium. So uh, if we were going to use the costings from Cory Glass, again, it would cost about 950 billion. So that's a fairly good estimate of how expensive uh, these stored backup systems will be. Now, the government is not serious about Britain converting to electric generation using renewable energy, intermittent renewable energy, unless they address the energy storage problem, which they are not doing. Nobody is talking about this. Yet they've known about this for 15 years or so because they were told about this by Professor McKay, he was the former government science advisor who wrote this booklet, Sustainable Energy Without Hot Air. Uh, I'd recommend you download it. It's freely available as a PDF. It's got lots of good information in it. A little bit too complex because he used different units of energy in each chapter, which was a bit of a failing, but there we go. It's still got lots of good en um, information on renewable energy. The problem being that Professor McKay, even though he was an uber greenie, could not make renewable power work for the UK. So what he did is he came up with five potential plans for renewable energy in the UK. These are those. Uh, we're not going to go through them all, but you'll see that all of these plans have a large block of what you might call baseload energy, and then lots of little things down below. So the major blocks that he was looking at were... So these are costings just for 60% of our energy needs, not all of our energy needs. And the first one he was looking at was offshore wind. Um, so how much offshore wind will we need to back up, well, to um, uh, supply 60% of our power? We will need 100 Hornsey 3s at a cost of 850 billion. Um, Hornsey 3 is the largest wind farm in the world that's being built in the North Sea at present. We will need 100 of those. Are we going to build 100 Hornsey 3s in the next 27 years? Of course we're not. Um, and that's not the only problem because these things only last for 25 years. So you've got to renew them. That's another 850 billion years over the 50 year uh, span of this project that I'm putting together here. And then they're intermittent, of course, the wind doesn't always blow. So we need the um, pump storage backup. That's another thousand billion. So we've got a grand total here of 27, uh, 2,700 billion just to cope with 60% of our power needs. And that is not going to be built in 27 years. I'm not even sure that we have enough continental shelf on which to build all these farms. Uh, notwithstanding that it's going to destroy the fishing industry as well. You're not going to be able to trawl in, in amongst all of those wind turbines. It's 28,000 of the largest wind turbines um, built out in the North Sea. Now, the second major block of energy he was looking at uh, was solar, and he recognized, even though he was a greenie, this is Professor McKay, um, he recognized that solar power doesn't work in the UK. So he said, we'll build it down in the Sahara where the sun does shine. Now, this was a this this is where Professor McKay goes into fantasy mode. But uh, anyway, let's look at it and see what happens. So solar in the Sahara, how much solar power will we need? Um, we'll need 3,900 Rorton airfields. Now, Rorton Airfield is probably the largest of the solar arrays in Britain. We don't have gigantic ones. We only have fairly small ones. Uh, 3,900 Rorton Airfields at a cost of uh, 320 billion. So quite a snip, really. Pretty cheap. Although I have to say that the price of these solar panels will go up as they become rarer because everyone will be piling into the industry and there won't be the um, raw materials around to actually make them. So that price will double, I'm sure. Um, the other problem being that they wear out in 25 years. So 
you've got to renew them. That's another 320 billion for this 50 year project. Uh, the next problem is we need to pay rent. It's not our land. If we're renting land down in the Sahara uh, from Tunisia and Libya and Algeria, uh, and also rent the land for the cables going back through France and Spain. I, I costed that at 30 billion a year. So that's another uh, 1,500 billion over the 50 year project. And then we come to the cables. Now, this is this is a tricky problem. I based um, the cost of these cables because we're not we don't like bare cables hanging around in, in Europe. We try and bury them if we can. And so the costings here are based on the Swedlink cable, which goes from northern Germany to southern Germany. And they're having terrible problems actually building that. But because this cable from North Africa is, is much longer and it will have to carry much more electricity, we will need 340 Swedlinks at a cost of 3,100 billion pounds. And that includes, includes the 15% losses within the cable itself. Basically, the cable heats up and loses energy. Uh, 340 Swedlinks. How on earth are we going to build that? How long will it take uh, to build that sort of cabling. Um, and then, of course, that's not the total problem because um, the sun doesn't always shine, even in the Sahara. They have nighttime there as well. Uh, so we need the backup storage system. We've already costed that at a thousand billion. So the total comes in at 6,240 billion of our pounds. Now, in dollar terms, uh, probably add on about 30% to that. So that's something like um, nine thousand billion dollars something of that nature okay i don't think that's going to happen within 27 years we're not going to build all of that infrastructure in uh 27 years um so the third major block that professor mckay was looking at and i know this has had a bad rap over the last 40 years is nuclear power but if you're concerned about co2 which i'm not terribly nuclear power is a good option because it is very, very low CO2. Um, so how much would this cost? Well, we've got a very good um, example of this because we're building two nuclear power stations at present, one at Hinkley Point, one at uh, Sizewell C in the UK. So we've got good costings for this. The problem is we're going to need 30 Hinkley Points at a cost of 600 billion. Um, now, Hinkley Point, the number of delays they've had on this project. Uh, these are 15 year, 20 year projects by the time they actually finish them. Um, so how long is it gonna take us to build 30 nuclear power stations uh, <laughs> to cope with 60% of our power needs? It's not gonna happen in 12 years until 2035. It's not gonna happen in 27 years up to 2050. It's just not going to happen. Now the good thing about nuclear power is we don't need the um, uh, we don't need to renew it after 25 years because we know power stations can last 50 years at least, and we don't need the pump storage backup uh, because nuclear power is reliable. It has a dispatch rate of 95%, uh, sometimes 98%. So all we need is the fuel and the reprocessing, and that's 220 billion over 50 years. It's fairly cheap at present, but stand by on those prices. If everyone piles into nuclear power, of course, those prices will go up. So that comes out with a cost of 820 billion. Um, and those are our options if we want to go all electric, i.e. get rid of the fossil fuels. So let, since we've mentioned nuclear power, let's have a look at its CO2 and its safety. Oh, sorry, before that, um, Ah, there we go. Um, before that, let's have a, a, a word about the new green economy, because one of the uh, poster childs for this campaign, which you've seen in America with the Green New Deal, is this will bring jobs, it will bring, bring employment, it will bring industry into the region. Uh, so we'll all benefit from this new green energy economy. Well, I'm not sure about that, because if we look at the Hornsey 3 uh, wind farm, 
It's being built by a Danish company using Swedish wind turbines, um, using German uh, gearboxes and generators and Japanese cables. So where is the green economy for Britain in this deal? Same with solar in the Sahara. You can bet that every single one of those solar panels will be made in China and the cables will be made in Germany and Japan, which is where they're all made at present. And nuclear power, despite Britain being at the forefront of nuclear power back in the 1960s with our advanced gas-cooled uh, nuclear reactors, we didn't build pressurized water reactors like you did in America. We had gas-cooled nuclear power stations. And they've proved to be very reliable and very safe. Uh, they're just being decommissioned now. But our new nuclear power stations are being built by the Chinese and the French. So where is the green economy in that for Britain? Yeah, it doesn't exist, does it? So let's look at the safety of uh, nuclear power. So CO2 and safety. Let's look at CO2 first. This is a graph of estimated levelized CO2 emissions from different types of fuel. Uh, as you can imagine, at the top, we've got coal, then natural gas, uh, then natural gas with carbon capture. And right down at the bottom here, we have wind and nuclear. So if you're concerned about uh, CO2, then nuclear is a very good option. Um, and the second bit we want to look at is safety. So this is a graph of safety, death rates per unit of electrical production um, from our world in data. Our world in data has got a lot of good information. If you're in, interested in medical information, populations, all of this sort of, they've got a graph for everything in this, uh, uh, in this website. Anyway, this is death rates per unit of electricity production. Uh, the top, we have brown coal, coal, oil, biomass, gas, and right down at the bottom, we have wind, nuclear, and solar. Now, okay, nuclear has had a bad rap over the last 40 years because it's had three major problems. But remember, there are 450, no, 430, I think, nuclear power stations around the world. Um, and we've only had three incidents. That's three too many, of course, but we've only had three incidents. And the number of people who were killed was actually very low. Uh, in Three Mile Island, nobody died. In uh, Fukushima, only one person died of uh, radiation poisoning. Uh, Chernobyl, we can talk about that later, but it wasn't significant in terms of coal, oil, and gas, which has a far higher um, uh, death rates for those uh, for, for those um, fuel types. And while we're talking about nuclear, we might as well look at um, a bit of nuclear that you might not be aware of because it's not the panacea that you may think it is. <clears throat> so let's look at um, nuclear problems, since we're probably going to be using a lot of nuclear in the future. Let's look at uranium first. Uh, which is what we're using at present throughout the world. Trouble is with uranium, it's very low efficiency. Only a half a percent uh, of the fuel is burnt, only the U-235. This is mainly due to a complete failure of the um, fast breeder reactor programs. Uh, they're all shut down across the West now. The only people with fast breeders uh, are India and China. Um, and fast breeder reactors would have overcome some of these um, fuel efficiency problems because you can then burn the U-238 as well. But that has been a failure so far. So we've only got about 200 years of easy uranium available. If everybody piles into uranium, if the whole world goes for nuclear power, we don't actually have much of it around before it starts becoming quite rare and becomes quite expensive. We also have the problem of reprocessing plants. So you've got to truck this fuel around the world to reprocessing plants. You've got the storage of long half-life waste products. Everybody knows about the 20 and 30,000 year waste products. That's a problem. And the possibility of meltdowns. We've already had three meltdowns already, which shouldn't have occurred, but they did. You know, Faults always occur. 
So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative obviously is thorium. And here he is, Thor himself. Um, now, thorium power does work. The Americans made a thorium reactor back in the 1960s, so they proved the concept. Um, it's just another nuclear type of fuel, basically. But it has many advantages over uranium. Uh, it's high efficiency, 99.9% .9 of the uh, U232 is actually burned because it's a natural breeder. Uh, we don't need to worry about that, basically. Um, but it means that we have, and I've seen quotes of anything from 80,000 years to 5 million years of easy thorium available in the crust because it's, it's concentrated fairly well. It's been dug up in mines all across the world. And in fact, we have 200 years of thorium sitting in waste dumps because it's a waste material at present. It comes out with um, rare earth elements. Uh, and so since nobody is using it, it's just being stored. Um, you cannot, well, it's very difficult to make nuclear weapons with thorium because of uh, gamma radiation, which will destroy your electronics. Um, there's no separate reprocessing plants are required. You have no long or very, very few half long half-life waste products. So the waste products are only 200 years, 300 years, not 20,000 years, 30,000 years. That's a definite advantage. And you can build a stable core that cannot melt down, i.e. a molten salt reactor, um, which is naturally stable and will naturally shut itself down if it has a problem. Uh, now, if people want to know more about thorium, if this is a new subject for you, I suggest the videos by uh, Kirk Sorensen, who has been the cheerleader for thorium for the last 15 years or so. Um, <clears throat> some very good videos out there showing the advantages of thorium. Now, thorium works. China is working on a th thorium uh, reactor at present. The problem in the West is we're putting all of this money into renewables, probably wasting all of this money into renewables, and nobody is putting any money into thorium research when it may well be the panacea, the form of energy that can keep us going for 100,000 years, maybe a million years, who knows how much there is out there. <clears throat> that is the problem that we have at present with modern politics. It's too focused on one particular solution. So in summary, we're coming towards the end here. Uh, what have we learnt? Well, CO2 is the most essential gas in the atmosphere. Without CO2, all life on Earth will die. CO2 is not a very powerful greenhouse gas. Well, we didn't look too much at this, but basically all of those models you see from the climate scientists have all exaggerated the effects of CO2. Um, we can maybe go through some of this later. Uh, in fact, I think many videos on this channel have explored that problem with the exaggeration of the models. Climate change is not as bad as advertised. We've seen the tornadoes and the hurricanes, how they've been reducing. Most renewable energy needs stored backup and nobody is looking about building any stored energy solutions. And they're going to be expensive, very expensive. So mandating electric vehicles and electric heating without generating capacity is utterly ridiculous. However, alternate energy supplies are required because we will run out of fossil fuels. Now, in Britain, we reached peak coal peak production of coal in 1911. We reached peak gas and peak oil in the year 2000. We in Britain are running out of fossil fuels, and the world eventually will run out of fossil fuels. Whether it's 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, we will start running out of fuels. And by running out, I mean that um, supplies will start drying up, and so the price gets higher and higher and higher until you don't really want to use it. So we do need to look at alternate types of fuel. Um, I think we need to have 60% of nuclear power. So I think, well, the French already have 80%, I think, of the French grid is already nuclear. 
and they're not having many problems with that nuclear and also their energy costs are half of what we are paying in Britain at present. So I think we should, and I don't think I've ever said this before, I think we should actually follow the French model and we should start going towards 60% of nuclear power. Um, problem is uranium is a limited resource as, we, as we've just explored, rather like fossil fuels. We don't have that much of it if we're looking forward the next century, two centuries, three centuries. And we really have to, we really have to start looking forward for the next thousand years. And there is not that much uranium available unless we get fast breeder reactors. The alternative is thorium power as we've looked at, but the problem is that Western governments are not putting any money into investigating thorium power. So, Governments across the West are not serious about keeping the lights on, about maintaining our wealth and our prosperity. And so that is the end of this talk. And the takeaway from this talk, I hope, is don't panic. The world is not going to end in five years, as an uneducated teenager tried to tell us. And the world is not going to end in 12 years, as an uneducated member of Congress tried to tell us. So let's slow down a bit, have a talk about this, have a think, and let's produce a rational and realistic energy policy that will keep the lights on into the future. Well, I have to say, if I want to just blow my trumpet a little bit, I've been on this topic for many years. I wrote the beginnings of this article back in 2004, would you believe? So I've been at this uh, nearly 20 years. So this is my data uh, from my paper that I wrote back in 2004, and I've just built on it since then. And it hasn't changed much. You know, nobody, that's 20 years ago. Ministers uh, in Britain and America could have been looking at this problem 20 years ago, and we could have had viable solutions. But we haven't, because they've all been burying their heads in the sand. They've been kicking the can down the road, and nobody is looking. I mean, for instance, our prime minister, this is uh, Cameron. So this is going back 15 years or so. Um, who was an uber greeny, of course, he put a windmill on the top of his house, uh, which didn't work, it produced seven watts. Yeah, very great. Um, so anyway, David Cameron, as Prime Minister said, we can't really go for nuclear power, because it will take 15 years to build the nuclear power stations. Well, that was 15 years ago, for God's sakes, we could have had them up and running by now. Uh, that's how short sighted our uh, politicians are. So yeah, looking at the, the climate side of this, of, of course, I've always been on what's up with that, uh, and looking at Judith Curry, uh, Svensmark, all of the famous names uh, in the uh, skeptic community. I hate that word skeptic, because we're just realists, we're climate realists. People like um, uh, Willis Eschenbach, who I think is great at his debunking of some of the uh, climate um, papers that people keep putting out, and they don't seem to understand mathematics, um, uh, whereas Willis does. So that's always good. Um, on the energy side of it, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, people like um, Kirk Sorensen, of course, with his thorium lectures, they've always been good. But I've I've known myself from my own my own work, my job, um, how the energy system works. So a lot of that has come through my own investigations and uh, the realization that uh, renewables are intermittent. I wrote about this in 2004. The, the, the title of the paper was Renewable Energy, Our Downfall. And that was written back in 2004. And of course, now it's all becoming true. Now we have these intermittent problems where we're getting blackouts, like the blackout they had uh, down in South Australia, which was caused by uh, wind turbines. And this is a subject we haven't touched on here, um, having a mismatch in the um, frequency. Now, this didn't used to be a problem because you had these vast uh, turbine halls in a coal-fired power station with an enormous great turbine weighing, you know, I don't know, three or four hundred tons, spinning at a constant 
whatever it is, 2,500 RPM to produce 50 hertz, and they all sync up together. Now, you don't get that with wind. You've got to try and sync up all of these different wind turbines to this 50 hertz. And if you get a mismatch, the whole grid falls down. And I'm surprised we've not had many uh, more grid failures because of that little problem. Um, so there are many problems with integrating this intermittent renewable energy into our grids. And at present, we're being very lazy because we are using gas, methane gas, as a backup. And therefore, people are saying, well, wind and solar are very cheap. Yeah, because you're relying on gas as the backup source. If you stood on your own two feet with your own stored energy systems, suddenly you would find that renewables are three times more expensive because you've got to build all of those storage systems to go alongside it. And then you get these stupid um, uh, media headlines and newspaper headlines. We've just built, uh, I think it's the largest battery in the world. It's one of these Tesla batteries uh, up in the Northeast of Britain. And they're championing this is the way forward. Look, we've got this enormous great battery. Well, that enormous great battery will keep the UK grid going for 15 seconds. That's the problem. Batteries are not going <laughs> to, they're not going to come up to this challenge. That's why we need something like pump water storage, which at least, you know, at Denorwig, we can get 10 gigawatt hours out of Denorwig. And that could be increased if they increase the size of the pond above it. Um, yeah, batteries are not going to work. Um, all of these other fantasy projects are not going to work. That's something I've always hated about the whole of this industry. There is too much fantasy in this industry. Crescent Dunes down in America, I think they spent about a billion dollars on that uh, device. And it lasted for three years and closed down. It was a big solar plant down in the, the deserts of South, southern North America. Um, it's closed down already only lasted about three years. It was just far too expensive. Um, in, the, in Europe, and also you had it in America, in Europe, they built a solar road. Well, they built 100 meters of it. But a, you can imagine, roads are difficult to, to keep free of potholes anyway when they're just made of asphalt, let alone when you're building them of solar panels. So anyway, they built a solar ro road at enormous expense. I think they spent something like $15 million on this, uh, and it lasted two months. Um, <clears throat> simply not going to work. There's too many fantasies going around. But because governments are just throwing money at problems, people are going to spend that money. They're going to put their hand in the pot, and they're going to take some of that money and spend it on a fantasy. Uh, one of the worst fantasies I've had recently was a project by Rolls-Royce. So these are respected names in industry. Rolls-Royce and Airbus got a 160 million euro uh, grant for making a uh, hybrid aircraft. Complete and utter fantasy. You cannot make a hybrid. Um, because <clears throat> if you think about it, my diesel car will do better MPG than any hybrid because it's direct drive. Whereas a hybrid has to go through a rectifier, um, uh, a generator, a rectifier, a battery, an inverter, and back into the uh, motor. So you've got lots of extra weight and you've got lots of extra losses in that system over a um, direct drive. The only, the only reason that a hybrid works is because if you're in town, you can get lots of regenerative braking. And that's an advantage, of course. But if you're out on the motorway, then a direct drive is much better, of course. It's lighter and you have fewer losses. Um, same is true as, with aircraft. Aircraft do not drive in towns. They have the same power setting for hours on end. So there is no regenerative braking to give any assistance. And the power source ends up being much, much heavier. The power source for this um, hybrid aircraft, they built it around a jet aircraft, a 146 jet aircraft. 
the power system ended up four times as heavy. And, and it took up all of the fuselage because they had nowhere else to put it. They put it inside the fuselage. And Rolls-Royce had promised that this hybrid aircraft would reduce CO2 emissions by 70%. That's how they managed to get this enormous great grant. Um, the aircraft they produced actually increased CO2 emissions by 400% per passenger. And it never flew. It couldn't fly. It was too heavy and it was too hot inside the fuselage. They couldn't cool the uh, engine that was stuck inside it. It was a complete fantasy from start to finish. And that's the problem we're getting with throwing money at this problem. We're not getting rational solutions because people are fixated on inter intermittent renewable energies. And they're not looking at the full extent of what might be out there. And obviously, the one we've got to be looking at is nuclear power. Uh, eventually, of course, we've got to start looking at fusion. But that's been 10 years ahead for the last 60 years. So I'm not sure we're going to get very much closer on that one. Uh, but we do need alternative energy supplies. In America, we've got this idea uh, that let's just, you know, let's drill. Let's go back to fossil fuels. Yeah, OK. I have no problem with the CO2 emissions. I don't think that's uh, as much as a problem as people think. And if, if people think it is a problem, I would recommend they read um, Tropical Skies by Dr. John Christie uh, from the University of Alabama. Um, the true test of greenhouse gas warming is the temperature in the tropical troposphere, not the surface temperature. So Dr. Christie was measuring tropical tropospheric temperatures, and they have not increased in line with surface temperatures. And yet they are the foundation of all um, greenhouse global warming. It happens in the atmosphere first, and it is the atmosphere that warms uh, the ground. But when you measure the atmosphere, the amount of warming is only a third or only a quarter of what the IPCC is uh, saying for surface temperatures. So there is a complete mismatch here. There is something wrong with the surface temperatures. Uh, either they're being exaggerated by homogenization, as they call it, which is the adjustments they make to the temperatures, or um, the surface temperatures themselves have errors, like the urban heat island effect and all, all of these. Uh, effects, or they are being uh, affected by things like oceanic cycles, which are not included in the IPCC models. Uh, you can get the same sort of heating effects just through oceanic cycle changes. Um, but anyway, there is this mismatch between the fundamental temperature, which is the tropical tropospheric temperature, and what the surface temperature is doing. And if we go along with the tropical tropospheric temperatures, it is saying that uh, greenhouse warming is not really a problem. It's only giving 1.1 degrees of warming for a, doubling of, uh, for a doubling of CO2, which is not actually very much at all. So that's another problem. But going back to the fossil fuels, uh, yet we can drill baby drill and get as much fossil fuels at present as we like, but that is not a sustainable solution for the next millennium. At some point, we've got to be responsible citizens and start looking forward to the next century, next two centuries, and say um, to our great, 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 great grandchildren, look, this is the direction we want to go. We want alternative sources of energy. And I think we need to start looking at uh, nuclear uh, more deeply than we are. Okay, um, I am almost out of time, actually, myself. Uh, any other uh, final points you'd like to make before we go ahead and finish? No, I think that's fine. Hopefully, uh, people will uh, engage in this. I try to come on to the uh, video and uh, answer questions. So if anyone has any questions, put them in the comments, and I'll see if I can answer them. All right, thanks very much. Uh, Ralph Ellis, I appreciate it. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Right, goodbye.